From haunted houses and abandoned asylums to creepy forests and deserted graveyards, we're going to be taking you on a journey to uncover the mysteries and legends that lurk in the shadows. So, grab a blanket, turn off the lights, and get ready to be transported to a world of ghost spirits and things that go bump in the night. Welcome to the swamp, my friends, and welcome back if you are new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true horror stories sent in by viewers just like you that revolve around the strange and unexplained. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them on reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. Now, without further ado, let us jump right into these creepy and allegedly true unexplained horror stories, sent in by viewers just like you. Ghost Hunting in Rural Georgia by J. Mad. Hi, Swamp Dweller. My other stories have not been all that scary and more of enjoyable type tales that I thought you'd like. So I decided to share one of the times that I was truly afraid for my life. In Georgia, there are a lot of bridges, and most of them are covered. My family and I have made a point to try to go to all of them. But there is one in particular that we enjoy going to mainly because we think it's haunted. People see different things and hear other things. You'll see items left behind by people doing ceremonies and things like that. Candles, salt ring pentagrams, stuff like that. The night that scared me, we had gone out to the bridge. We were taking pictures, asking questions, and recording like always. We've got some pretty exciting recordings and answers to our questions in the past. We even got disembodied screams that nobody heard at all at the time, but when we played it back, it was clear as day. There were always orbs when people in the group were feeling things. This particular night, it was rather hushed. No one was picking up anything. No lights, no noises. But that was the thing. It was extra quiet. There was no noise from anyone except the nearby road. Now, this bridge you cannot cross with a car. You have to walk on it. The wood is very old and has given away in some places, so you must be incredibly careful. This night, we made it across the bridge. I would get a bad feeling very often, but it would be because the others were running away, or screaming, or messing with us. Finally, we all made it to the other side of the bridge. We were standing there, and on that particular side of the bridge was private property. Unlike the bridge and the other side, it was county property. So, none of us really dared to step onto the private property. But we did exit the bridge, turn around, and look up. As we did this, there was this creature hanging halfway off the top of the bridge. It was white, almost see-through skin. It was skeletal, and the skin didn't seem to fit its bones. It was like it was loose, but not so open that it was sagging. And then, there was the smell. I've been around dead bodies before, for various reasons. And honestly, it smelled like when a body's pulled out of a body of water that had been sitting in there for quite some time. A floater. A bloater, if you will. People have many terms for it, but it smelled awful. The eyes were somehow black and yet red at the same time. The black was blacker than night. I know that doesn't really make any sense. And the red was like a ring in the eye. It had unnaturally long arms and legs and was crawling and holding on to the top of the bridge. The group I was with ran back onto the bridge, tripped, and crawled to get to the car. I was staring at this thing absolutely in awe. It was staring back at me. I felt cold all over. It was like I couldn't move, and I know it sounds cliche at this point, but this is... this is far before Harry Potter or any of those things that I've ever seen. The only way I can describe this thing is like a Dementor, making you feel like as you'll never be happy again, like it was sucking the soul right out of my face. That's what this felt like. My friends were yelling for me to come on. They had already made it to the car, and they didn't realize until they arrived that I was still standing there, frozen in place. Suddenly, I felt this trance kind of just end. I shook it off and started running back onto the bridge. The creature slashed its arm at me, and one of the claws on its hand caught me just a little bit. I heard it running on the bridge's roof. As I sprinted for the car... Everyone was already there screaming, flashing the light and honking the horn, doing anything they could think of to try to scare this creature away. As I exited the bridge, the arms came down, grabbed me just under the armpits by both arms, and attempted to lift me. 
I dug my hands into the arms, holding me, thrashing around, kicking and screaming. I'm unsure whether I threw the creature off balance or what happened, but it fell from the roof and I went tumbling with it. I got up quickly, ran to the car and got in. We tore out of there. I still have a little scar on the back of my neck from all this. We returned to the bridge several times after this, and I've never seen that creature again. But none of my friends that night would ever talk to anybody about what they had seen. They were afraid that they would be considered crazy. I'm the only one left who remembers that night. My other friends died over the years from medical issues and old age. I don't know what it was, and I've never felt anything like that from any other spirit or creature I've ever encountered over the years. As I said, I don't know what the heck it was. I don't know what it wanted or why it singled me out. Maybe because of my sensitivity and everything else that supernaturally had come in and out of my life over the years, uh, I couldn't tell you. All I know is that when I was unsure if I would survive, I felt like my, 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 my days were numbered. I saw my life flashing before my eyes and I had no idea if anybody would ever know what happened to me. Thank you, Swamp Dweller, for letting me tell my story. The Creature in the Holler by Teresa P. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I've been listening to your YouTube channel for about six months, and I am finally comfortable enough to share my story. To give you some background, I live in a part of West Virginia where every wrong term movie was made. I live about two miles off the paved road back at the very end of the holler. We have plenty of regular wildlife such as bears, coyotes, etc. I've been comfortable deep in the mountains for years until about six months ago. It was about 2am and I was woken by the hunting hounds out back going nuts, barking their absolute heads off. So I turned on my bedside lamp got up and put on my bathrobe. I was just about to go back to see what the problem was when I saw this creature outside my bedroom window. Now, the windows are about six feet off the ground from the outside, making this creature anywhere between eight to nine feet tall. I was frozen in place in fear. This thing had a massive head. It was either a wolf or a dog or something in between. It was moving upright on two legs. It was covered in dark hair and had an elongated snout with a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth. I returned to my senses and reached over to turn off the lamp. As I did, the thing turned to look at me. It had almost glowing, yellow eyes and let out this massive growl that pierced through the night. It shook me to the core. Then, suddenly, I was moving, running through the house, closing windows, locking them and locking doors. I huddled in the bathroom with my cell phone, calling my husband at work and begging him to come home. Instead, he said he was leaving immediately and he told me to get the rifle and keep it with me. I returned to the bedroom to get the rifle, and suddenly there was banging on the outside wall. It sounded like fist being beaten against the outside of the house. I was terrified that it was trying to get in. I returned to the bathroom and hid in the tub with the rifle. I heard some more pounding and then suddenly all went quiet. I waited and after a couple of minutes I heard sirens. My husband had called the police. He told them to meet them at the house because I was hysterical on the phone and he had no idea if it was an intruder or what else. So after ensuring that I was okay and nobody else was about, we went outside with the police. Where I heard the pounding, there were sets of dents on the side of our house about 10 feet off the ground. There were claw marks all around the bedroom window as if something had tried to get in. My husband has changed shifts so now he is always home at night. We also put up three pole lights to light the entire perimeter at night. The mountains of West Virginia are a wonderful sight to see, but they also have monsters. So be careful hiking and camping in this region, and always try to be in a group, never alone. Mount Kearsarge Supernatural Experience by Anonymous this story takes place on a lake in central New Hampshire, just a few miles north of the base of Mount Kersarge. My friend has a cabin there, and his grandfather built it shortly after returning from the Second World War. And one warm summer night between my junior and senior years of high school, he and I were there, just hanging out. While we did drink and partake in the ganja from time to time, we were not intoxicated in any way on this night. 
We had simply been bored in our little hometown about 30 miles or approximately 48 kilometers to the south. So on a whim one evening, we decided to drive up and spend the night there to light a fire and sit by the water on the beach chairs and enjoy the nighttime t-shirt and swimming trunks weather while it lasted. I would say it was around 9 or 10 p.m. and we had gotten up to inspect his grandfather's old canoe that laid upside down atop the wooden dock because we wanted to use it the next day to head to the Lone Island to look for loon nests and try to catch some catfish. As we walked to the dock from where we had been sitting, I gazed across the lake at Mount Kirsarge. The mountain has a height of 2,937 feet or 895 meters and a prominence of 2,080 feet or 630 meters. So, since it was basically 2,000 feet straight up from our position, as we were only a couple of miles from its summit, it was quite an imposing figure in the night sky. Now the mountain has a tower on the peak that flashes a red light at night. There is only one light and it is red. I had seen it many times before. It was just a fact, however, as I followed my friend to the dock that I noticed there were more than two lights on this night. In addition to the usual red flashing light, there was a second yellowish orange orb to its right, essentially equidistant in height. It was not moving, flashing, pulsating, nothing. It just hung there, motionless in the night sky. I told my friend who was immediately interested, and so we were both just stood there, transfixed for a while before he asked me what the hell I thought it was. I would have immediately considered a helicopter, but it was just so still and silent. After just a few moments of silent staring, we both shrugged our shoulders and continued down to the canoe at the end of the dock. We inspected it for a while, placing it in the lake to check for leaks and decided that it was good to go, which was exciting, as we were really looking forward to getting on the water. After lugging it back to the original resting position, I turned to my right and bent down to wash the cobwebs off my fingers in the lake. As I was doing this, I returned my gaze to the mountain, and to my amazement, there were now two identical orbs, one on either side of the red flashing light. I smacked my friend across the shoulder and told him to look up, and again, we just stared transfixed, albeit this time a little more anxiety-ridden. What the hell? My friend said, with a bit of fear creeping into his voice. Without averting our gaze, we backpedaled to our chairs and began discussing possibilities. It is important to note that both of us were science-believing realists, and still are to this day. We both accepted the distinct possibility that we, humanity, were most likely not alone in this never-ending galaxy, let alone the universe. Something. All the grains of sand on Earth. You know, the old Carl Sagan adage. So, as we sat, discussing both the Fermi paradox and the likelihood that it was just some sort of temporary, human-made thing going on top of the mountain, something happened. Before our eyes, one of the orbs slowly descended below the backside of the mountain and out of sight. I am sorry, I know I am no aeronautical engineer or anything, but I know what a helicopter looks like when it descends in elevation. This was not like that at all. It sunk down and out of sight in less than just a few seconds, very smoothly, all without making any lateral movement whatsoever. We were stunned, but before we had time to wallow in this feeling or think that we could have possibly seen something unnatural, the other orb took off from its position. It did not gain or lose any elevation. It just took off horizontally at breakneck speed and began to make its way around the edge of the lake. It was not until the light was about halfway between its starting point and our position that we began to consider that it might be heading straight for us. We stood still at the shore and followed the objects with our eyes. Out of sheer curiosity and without speaking, we both made an unconscious decision to wait and see what would happen. I mean, what else were we supposed to do? At no point did we talk or look at each other. We just stood there, watching. Without leaving you in suspense for too long, the object did eventually arrive to where we were, and upon its arrival, it slowed to a crawl and crept over us at a snail's pace. It was big. Not stereotypically mothership big, but big. I do not know exactly, but if I had to estimate, I would say it was about 50 meters in length by 30 meters in width. It was shaped like a fat cigar and had two or three rows of orange lights on its bottom. I cannot tell you what my friend was doing or how he was reacting at this time, 
for I was entranced. I remember thinking that I had never had an opportunity to view something like this, and I probably would never get another chance again. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience, so I stared intensely, examining anything and everything about it that I could. Unfortunately, there were not many details that I could make out, only its approximate dimensions and the rows of lights. It made no real sounds aside from what I perceived to be a very, very faint humming. There were no beams of light shooting down at us or anything like that. We stood in the pitch blackness of the late New Hampshire night, and I remember preparing myself for something to happen to us. But as far as I know, nothing ever did. As soon as it had crept its way past us, it took off as fast as it had appeared, up into the night sky and out of sight. At that point, I shot my head back across the lake towards the mountain. There was nothing but the normal, flashing red light remaining. All appeared to be back to normal. I do not think we said anything to each other aside from, let's get out of here, or something to that effect, before grabbing what little we had brought with us and hightailing it back to my friend's car. We drove the 30 miles back to our hometown, purchased some snacks at the convenience store, and returned to his house where we proceeded to set up the same beach chairs that we had brought with us to the lake in his backyard, where we stayed up for most of the night, talking about what the hell we had just seen. For the next few weeks, my mind had hardly focused on anything else. I told my parents at some point, but they sort of just laughed it off, telling me that it must have been a helicopter or something like that. And after their reaction, I decided not to tell anyone else. Not until I was older and gave no crap about what people would think of me. It was only then that I began to tell my trusted friends about what happened that night. My friend and I have since parted ways. We live across an ocean from each other now and talk from time to time. In fact, it has been a few years since one of us brought it up. However, sitting here and writing this down, it just now made me want to reach out and talk with him again. I know what I saw, and it was not constructed by humanity. We do not have that sort of technology. At least, not that we know of. And if we do, there is far more hidden from the average citizen of the Earth than I thought possible. But I am digressing into conspiracy theories now, and that is a path that I try not to go down. The fact is that the possibility that we are alone in the universe is so microscopically small. Consider this, there are billions of planets out there that are much, much older than Earth. All it would take is one of them to have developed intelligent life a few million years before us, giving them a massive head start in the development and technology scheme that would allow them to create machines that could do what these objects are. Thank you for sharing my story, Swamp Dweller. I hope you enjoyed it. The Cabin Getaway, I'll Never Forget, by Anonymous. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight years old. My father had the great idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was sure cold. Well, it was almost December so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we would all sleep. We ate dinner and then we all got set up for bed and were thinking about what we would do tomorrow. We got there kind of late so we couldn't do too much on the first day. That night though, I heard noises outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing of note, so I figured it must have been an animal or something. I tried my very best to go back to sleep, and somewhere around 15 minutes later, I heard it again. This time though, I made sure to wake my sister up. She was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there. We weren't quite sure what it was. We decided it was best for it not to see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a hard time sleeping that night and so did my sister, but when we eventually woke up, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad and she told me sure while my sister stayed inside and waited for her breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a sort, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. 
He looked really nervous too for some reason. He was sweating a lot, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father looked at me and said, Oh, this is my son, and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, Nice to meet you, kid. My name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. It may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid. And I asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you alright? He kind of coughed and replied, Yeah, I'm fine. Just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said, as I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. He seemed rather normal at the time. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him at first too. He told my father he had also rented a cabin with his family, and that they were really close to us, and he decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast and he stayed, and it was seemingly normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him, and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come to his cabin, because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick. We talked about what I liked doing, and I told him about video games that I played and stuff like that. Then, things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size was. I told him, but I, I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something along the lines of, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting abandoned anymore, but I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. We entered the cabin and he told me to go in first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there. No family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he didn't hear. He locked the door. I then kind of got frightened. He told me, I'll be right back with a band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere, and then walked back and told me to have a seat and he put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg in his other hand and rubbed it down and told me, You're rather muscular, kid. I like that. I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I told him nothing and that my leg was feeling much better. I then thought my parents must be worried sick and I should hurry back. He insisted that I stay longer and ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone and if I ran, I don't think I could have found my way back to the cabin. The door was locked too, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with fast. He asked how much I weighed, and I guessed around 73 pounds. He then had a smile across his face. He nodded and said, Perfect weight. I asked him why it was perfect weight. He just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He said no, and that things were just getting started, and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said that. I then heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, Did I freaking tell you that you could move? No, so stay the hell where you are. I have company. Or something like that. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that. It was just my wife. She was really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while saying that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out of here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there, he said. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she had been crying a lot. She was sniffling and had red circles around her eyes. She looked at me, then walked back in the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on. That was the last straw. I had to get out of the situation, but I didn't know how to. I started crying and then he hugged me. He told me, it'll be okay little one, nothing is going to happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked in the back room. I thought that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take the chances with Patrick if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. 
He lied about having kids. Who knows what else? I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still close to his house, close enough to hear shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife. Things along the lines of, where the F did I go, and I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. Stuff like that. I could have sworn I heard him call her a bunch of names that I don't want to repeat. Then, it happened. I stopped in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and looked in his direction. He was outside and he seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I heard him shouting, Hey kid, it's okay, you can come back now, you don't have to try on the clothes. I have toys in the back of my cabin, if you want to come play with them, just come back. I then ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes I would find my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to hear it. Then, after about an hour of running, I saw a cabin. My cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy, and that he really was weird and he was touching my legs and stuff. My father immediately called the person he rented the cabin from, and he said that nobody had rented that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man, having the cabin rentals, called the police and the police went back there and checked the cabin, and there was nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, is what they told us. Nothing really happened after that. They asked questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, and how and why he lived in that cabin. He seemed to have been living there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that will likely never get answered. I'm just glad that it's all over. My Unexplained Paranormal Encounter by Creepiest Son I've heard many paranormal stories and there's always a little voice of doubt in terms of the storyteller's authenticity. But while these events didn't happen to me, they did happen to someone I was very close with and contain a few elements of corroboration. It's important for me to get a feeling for honesty when listening to a story that defies scientific belief. So, for what it's worth, this is an honest account. First, a little backstory. Miv was a fascinating woman. She was one of my best friends, which is a little odd because I met her when I was about 18 years old, and she was in her middle ages. I was a young guy into motorcycles and rock music. I played guitar and was into horror movies and working out. As a contrast, she was short, dumpy, had thin greasy hair, a walking stick, and wore thick bottle rim glasses. She was never without a cigarette in her hand, and her ashtray was always full. However, she was an unbelievable, astute, and wise woman, to the point where she was like a wise old oracle to me and my hippie friends. There was never a personal problem she could not fix with a few gentle words. I would often go to her tall, slightly creepy Victorian terrace house, and we would sit in her favorite room and chat philosophically. The air full of smoke and surrounded by dusty antiques and the odd stuffed bird. Her husband was, by all accounts, a wretched man. His nickname, by all, was The Wizard. Their house was pretty much all wood floors, narrow but tall. He wore an orthopedic shoe, known colloquially as a club foot. You'd hear him coming and clomping down the wood stairs from a mile away. As his nickname suggested, he had long gray hair and a little goatee that resembled a stereotypical devil. He always wore a gray suit and had wild staring eyes. He didn't seem altogether and right in his mind. That was apparent during any conversation you would have with him. I don't mean he was like crazy, more like he was old, significantly older than Miv, and his mind was just a little aged. When he was younger, he also gained a reputation for black magic. One brief account I heard was that there was a black magic circle known for their dark deeds, something like the Golden Dawn or something like that. Well, they wouldn't let him join because he was too dark. Suffice to say, he was probably into summoning things, 
Anyway, over the years before Miv died, we became very close, and I heard all kind of cool stories. The story I'm about to recount is, I guess, not so cool. At least not for her. But it's an interesting one. Years ago, when she and her husband were living in South Wales in the UK, they lived in a similar house to the one that I knew that she lived in. A tall, slightly spooky, aren't they all, Victorian terrace house. These houses were usually three stories, maybe a basement. I've lived in one myself, and they're inherently spooky, which kind of sets the tone. At the time, Miv and the wizard had just had their first child, who would grow up to become one of my best friends about 24 years later. She had also, she had also, not too terribly long ago, come out of a brief stint in a nun's convent, so she was very religious. With that came certain beliefs and attitudes which would soon be very much tested to breaking points. I'm not able to be exact with the timeline here, but Miv told me that she started hearing voices, distant at first, in the house, when no one was around. As if often the case in many of these stories, she shrugged it off and ignored it as best she could, but then the voices started to address her directly. Now at this stage, she recalls being very worried that she was in fact unwell, and her biggest fear was that her son would get taken away from her due to her inability to take care of him. So, she told no one. The voices got worse and eventually would start saying things like, We're going to drive you mad. And she would say things like that, and so forth. If that wasn't enough though, she would soon start to see a dark shadowy figure at the top of the stairs. She told me that it would always appear in such a way, that as you turned to look to see if there was something there, you'd almost stumble at the top of these steps and fall to your death. Still, she refused to talk about it. In her mind, and with her religious beliefs, there was no room for ghosts to exist, so it was a subjective phenomenon, and she was indeed losing her marbles. In this house, they had a cleaner. The cleaner would always leave the front door wide open when she was cleaning the stairs in the hall. Miv assumed it was to get fresh air, maybe to help dry the floor. One day, when it was cold, Miv questioned her. Why do you keep that door open? It's so cold. Her response changed Miv's life at this point. She said, It's so if that dark thing at the top of the stairs comes for me, I can get out of here right quickly. Again, bear in mind that Miv had not told anyone about this phenomenon. One day, she had a friend over. The friend was a big, burly, tough woman who stood no nonsense. She didn't believe in any of this supernatural rubbish and was not afraid of ghosts. After sitting in their living room and this lady giving Miv something of telling her off for being so silly and superstitious, the lady got up to go to the bathroom. She came back a moment later, her face white. You okay? said Miv. Can you come with me? replied the lady. Because you don't know where the bathroom is? No, because I'm not going up there on my own with that dark shadow. Another story shared with me was that Miv was bathing her son in the upstairs bathroom when someone knocked on the front door to the house. She yelled down to them, and it turned out to be a friend, so she shouted for him to come up and that she was in the bathroom. She heard him walk up the stairs. He then suddenly broke into a sprint, came running into the bathroom, threw his arms around Miv, and clung to her like a baby terrified of what he had just seen. Eventually, it all came to a head when this entity started to entice her into something more sinister. She recalls hearing the voices beckoning her upstairs to the dark top floor bedroom. The weird thing here, and what's hard to explain, if only because I don't quite understand it, is that she felt compelled to obey. It got her up the stairs. She would stop. She would resist, and it would gently insist that she continues upward. And again, she would obey against her will. This happened all the way until she got to the bedroom with the lights out. If I recall correctly, the thing asked her to turn the lights out, and she at first said no, but again it insisted. This is crazy, I know. It eventually got her to lie down on the bed. Laying there in the dark, she then described how this entity began to assert itself onto and into her body. She described it like assault, but through her pores, if that makes any sense. She began an internal struggle at this stage, and in that struggle was able to draw some willpower to call out the name of Jesus or something like that. I forgot whether she said a small prayer, 
but some form of religious statement, and the thing went away instantly. I'm sure there are many other anecdotes. The other friends in our circle know of these stories too and have probably heard their own tales. So, I may be missing a few key pieces. All I know is that they shortly moved out of that house. Now, one thing that does stand out as interesting, after discussing the story with a mutual friend who knew Miv for years before I met her, he told me that she'd also said this to him, but around that time that they left the house for good, she saw the wizard kneeling and burying something, and it was thought that he was doing something. Whatever he was doing, though, resembled a closing ceremony for when someone summons a demon. I know some of this won't make any sense, and I don't really expect it to. Why would you stay married to someone that evil, though? I asked myself that question. In fact, you know something? I asked her that same question at least once. She took a long drag on her cigarette, gave a long, slow shrug as she exhaled, and said something about feeling sorry for him. The whole dynamic will have me scratching my head. Miv was incredibly wise in some ways, and yet nonsensical in other ways, but there seemed to be more to that family story than meets the eye. Eventually, they would have a daughter, who was born physically and mentally disabled. The daughter is only surviving family of the member now. My friend, her son, died of cancer about seven years after I met both him and his mother. The wizard died around that same time, too, and Miv... Heartbroken over the death of her son, died just two years after we buried him. She used to say, When I die, I'm going to haunt you, in her usual playful way. Eyes twinkling, taking a drag of a cigarette. She meant to come back and give me a clue about the other side. After attending her son's funeral, I was walking on the waterfront of my hometown. I was thinking about them both, and I felt tearful. I sat on the sea wall and spoke to her. I asked her why she didn't come to me to show me any evidence of the other side. I concluded, well, maybe she tried, but I can't see it. Maybe I can only see what I can only see. I stood up to walk away, and something compelled me, I don't know what or why, to look down where I was sitting. There, etched into the very slab of concrete I was sitting on, was the first, initial, and the last name of her son, who we had buried two days before. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true unexplained horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you have an encounter with something unexplainable, whether it's ghostly, supernatural, cryptid-like, or anything in between, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit stories via reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button, silly. It helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode. I upload them nearly every single day. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online.